Kindness can be a contagious thing. Even though videos like this one that we saw present a dramatized and a, a time-condensed picture, kindness really is catching. It, it's just that there seem to be so few sowing the seeds of kindness these days. Don't get me wrong, there are some very kind people doing some very kind things, and some of them are in this room today, I know that. But it doesn't take much of the morning paper or the evening news to become convinced that it's a very cruel world we live in. The testimony you heard today is evidence of that. Murder, mugging, stabbing, shooting, beating, robbing, raping, stealing, cheating. All these daily occurrences in our nation. Way back in the Stone Age in the 1990s, <laughs> George H.W. Bush ran and won the presidency of the United States. His campaign slogan was, a kinder, gentler nation. I don't think it took. Many of you in this room today have been victims of unkindness. Some of you here have at one time been unkind to yourself or you have been an unkind person, but we are called as disciples of Jesus to a higher plane. We are called to take it to the next level in our behavior as followers of Christ. In the midst of this cruel world, we have been called on to look at a different light and to display the fruit of the Spirit in our lives as we grow in Christ, to reflect Jesus, not the world, to those who see us. And what are those fruits of the Spirit? Let's say them together, and they're not on the screen today, folks. Here we go. Galatians 5, 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Good. Some of you are doing your homework. So far, we've looked at self-control, gentleness, faithfulness, and goodness. And today, we come to the heart of the fruit. There are nine fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5. Kindness is at the very center of that list. I don't think that's an accident. Kindness, as the sermon indicates, is the heart of of the fruit. When my mom was growing up, my great grandfather and his family were huge growers of watermelon and cantaloupe in the Sand Springs area over near Abilene. My great grandfather was once dubbed the Watermelon King of Kansas by a national agricultural magazine in the late 1920s. Agriculture of all types in those days was mostly physical labor. And so as my mother grew up, she helped with the watermelon harvest, with the weeding, the hoeing of those watermelons for years. There were about 20 brothers and sisters and cousins in that extended family who would help out with this totally manual labor project of raising 100 acres of watermelons or more. And mom, she used to smile when she told how often one of those cousins or brothers and sisters would accidentally drop a watermelon. <laughs> they would take turns at it so that no one got in trouble day after day, but you know why they dropped that watermelon? Because it would split open, and since in those days you couldn't waste anything, they had to eat it <laughs> right there in the field. But they would only usually have time to eat the heart of the watermelon before moving on. It, it just so happens that the heart is the sweetest part of any watermelon. It's also the part that contains very few, if any, seeds. And so they would devour that heart and then get back to work. So the accidents continued to happen occasionally because those Sand Springs watermelons are really sweet at the heart. 
In fact, the heart is usually the sweetest part of any fruit. So kindness is at the heart of the spirit, of the fruit of the spirit, and it is certainly sweet when we receive it, don't you think? And so it's in the running, I would say, as the most visible fruit when it's displayed in our lives. It's something that everybody sees when we're kind. When someone has the fruit of kindness growing in their life, it's going to probably be seen by others in the actions of the other fruits. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, self-control. If you're a kind person, those other fruits tend to stick out. All the other fruits also have specific behaviors associated with them. But when someone displays those other fruits, we'd likely look at them and say, well, they're a kind person. Kindness is at the heart of the fruit. Now, I want you to look at the scripture that's at the top of your notes today. It's from 2 Timothy 2, 24. And the Lord's servant, that's you and me if we're following Jesus, must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. I don't like that verse. I don't always want to be kind to everyone. You know what? Jesus doesn't care if I like it or not. It's his command. Is it really possible to be kind to everyone in a world like ours? The scriptures say that this is our calling. Hmm. So what are we talking about here? Let's investigate further. What exactly is kindness? You know, you got to define the terms here. Kindness is an inner attitude of the heart that expresses itself in an action of some sort. It is probably the one fruit of the Spirit that is the most impossible to hide. Kindness is meaningless. Listen to this. It's meaningless if it's only internal. It's nonsense to say we have kindness when we never display it. A person becomes known as a kind person by doing acts of kindness. And when kindness comes to the fruit of our lives, we will act on it in some way. We also need to understand that there are a lot of kind people in this world who do not know Jesus. Listen, many who don't call themselves Christians are kind people. As, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we do not have a monopoly on kindness. However, there are some things that are unique about Christian kindness. We do it for a different reason. So what is different about godly kindness? Number one, it takes the initiative. It takes the initiative. You go first. It takes the initiative. In Genesis 32, we find a prayer of Jacob's. In that prayer, Jacob says, Genesis 32.10, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. He's talking to God. And that was a true statement. Jacob was unworthy. Jacob was nicknamed the deceiver. He knew that he had shorted the Lord and cheated others in his life. He was a cheater. And he knew that he did not deserve the kindness of God. This is a typical remark from those who realize the unmerited kindness and grace of God. We hear it all the time. I don't deserve this. No, you don't. But it's given to you. They know they don't deserve it. But the Lord initiated it with Jacob. God was kind to Jacob before Jacob ever showed kindness toward the Lord. Godly kindness initiates and that's what God does with us. In dealing with us, God did not wait for us to be kind. God initiated kindness with you if you're a believer today. And if you're not, he has initiated kindness with you if you will see it. Open your eyes. Titus 3, verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, you can't be good enough to earn God's grace. He gives it to you out of his kindness. Romans 5.8, 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you get the picture? Godly kindness does not wait for a friendship to develop. It takes the initiative, and it's not simply reciprocal. It is easy to be kind to those we like or those who've been kind to us. That's a piece of cake. But godly kindness is a brand of kindness that can even be shown to enemies. Fruit of the Spirit type kindness goes out to those who disagree with us. Jesus type kindness takes the first step with those new neighbors and it continues to be kind even though they may not seem to respond. There's a second difference with the fruit of the Spirit called kindness. Number two, it is not based on lifestyle. It's not based on lifestyle. Luke 6, 35. You will be sons of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. <laughs> wow. Because God is kind to us before we are kind to Him, we must assume that His kindness is not based on our lifestyle. It sure wasn't in my case. In other words, God is kind even to those who do not always please Him. His kindness is not based on our performance. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God is kind even to the ungrateful and the wicked. Are you getting this? Now listen carefully. That does not mean that God embraces or blesses sin and wrongdoing. That does not mean that sin and evil will go unpunished or that they will not bear bad fruit in our lives. We all know that happens. We know that the Bible says that. It only means that God often chooses to deal with us kindly even when we don't deserve it. And the difference between God and the rest of us, even those who call themselves religious, is found in the following story. There was a foolish man who fell into a pit and he couldn't get himself out. A legalistic Pharisee came along and said, only bad people fall into the pit. A Christian scientist came along and said, you only think you're in a pit. A Pentecostal came along and said, just believe and confess, brother, that you are not in that pit and you will be free. A fundamentalist came along and said, actually, you really deserve that pit you're in. An optimist came along and said, cheer up, things could be worse. A pessimist came along and said, give up, things will get worse. An IRS man stopped and asked if the man had paid his taxes on the pit. <laughs> and then he got audited by the IRS. Jesus came along. And seeing the man in the pit, he jumped down into the pit, put the man on his shoulder so he could crawl out of the pit. And he took the man's place there. You see the difference? Holy Spirit kindness doesn't attempt to judge the lifestyle, the intellect, or the spirituality of an individual. It simply helps them out of the pit. And don't forget, true kindness will certainly try to help others avoid falling back into the pit. Nothing wrong with that. But even when people fall in more than once, we're called to show kindness in the appropriate way. Sometimes that means lending a helping hand. Sometimes that means tough love style examination of the causes that they're there. Sometimes it means helping the person to accept the consequences of foolishness. But kindness is not based on lifestyle. Third, heart of the fruit style kindness is long suffering. Isaiah 54, 8. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you. When I think of how many times God could have cut me down in righteous indignation and been right, it makes me shudder. God was long-suffering in His kindness toward me, 
And God is still long-suffering in his kindness toward me. And fellow sinners, if you are with the, in the sound of my voice today, God has been long-suffering with you. His kindness has held on through your many follies and weaknesses and betrayals. If you are still breathing air and living right now, you have been blessed by the long-suffering kindness and grace of our Lord. Rejoice in that. That's why kindness is the heart of the fruit. It goes the extra mile with people. It is different than worldly kindness that often draws back quickly if there are, it's not welcomed or appreciated. It hangs in there. There is a regularity to it even when there is not a reward to it. Godly kindness has a loyalty about it. It says, I will do this because my master has been loyal to me and I will be loyal to him. I love dogs. I'm a dog lover. And you know, dogs have been called man's best friend. But if you turn the word dog around, you'll find your true best friend. God. Ever think about that? God is dog spelled backwards. As proof of this, I read recently about a dog training workshop out in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's a story I read. And at that workshop, dog owners learned how a, a dog's disposition and loyalty can be tested by its owner. The instructor there said that if the owner would fall down and pretend to be hurt, an unloyal dog would, with a bad disposition, would tend to growl and bite at the person who had fallen down. A good dog, on the other hand, would show concern through whining or maybe even licking the owner's face, maybe even laying down beside them. One lady who attended that workshop decided to test her, her two household dogs that she had in her home. And so while she was eating pizza in her living room, she suddenly stood up, clutched her heart, screamed, and fell to the floor. The two dogs looked at her and looked at each other. Then they raced each other for the pizza that was on the table. <laughs> The lesson, we may not attack or growl at those who have fallen, but we may sometimes apathetically abandon them for pizza, whatever that pizza is in our lives. And that is not an example of long-suffering kindness. There's a fourth attribute to biblical kindness. It draws people to God. That's the purpose of all the fruits of the Spirit, to draw people to God. It's not to make us look good, it's to draw people to God. Jeremiah 31.3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. True kindness draws people. It draws them first to us, that's natural, and then... If we are properly reflecting the Lord Jesus, it draws them to the Lord. I mean, nothing cuts a person off like saying, you know, I'm not really that good. It's God working through me. I mean, he's, he's changed my life. Just a statement like that can be, wow, awesome. We should find a way to let them know in some way that we are just passing along something that has begun to grow in us because Jesus lives there now. And we are just passing along the kindness that we have received from him. It's not us. And if we do not do this, Christians, we are stealing glory that belongs to God. You want to be a thief? Don't steal God's glory. We may gain respect and be liked by people, but God is not glorified when we take credit for what rightfully belongs to him. It is God's intention to draw people to himself with his loving kindness to us and then through us. And if this nation is ever to become really kinder and gentler, it will not be because of a government program. It will be because the church has finally woke up and begun to reflect Jesus to the culture. There's another truth about kindness, and this is the hardest one for us to handle. It sometimes comes in rebuke. Mm. This principle is found throughout Scripture. 
I mean, it's, it's scattered throughout Scripture. But one example is Psalm 145 or 141.5. Here's what it says. Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It's like oil on my head. And in those, those days, you bless someone when you put oil on their head. So he's saying a rebuke is, is a blessing. That doesn't sound right to us sometimes. Kindness is sometimes best shown to us in the rebuke of a brother or a sister in Christ or a good friend who loves the Lord. The kindest things our true friends can do for us is to can occasionally tell us that we're acting like a jerk, so knock it off. I love how Proverbs 27 says it. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6. Better is the open rebuke than a hidden love. An enemy multiplies kisses, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. You hear that? If you've got friends who've told you you're going the wrong way, listen to them. Another version of this says, wounds from a friend can be trusted. Sometimes we need to remember that the, the kindest thing the Lord may do for us in our entire life, other than dying for us on the cross, is to correct us, to thump us on the head. When God rebukes us, He does so in love and hope that we will turn around. And sometimes the Lord sends us a prophet in a human body to correct us. But it's a kindness. Receive it. So as disciples of Jesus, let us not be too quick to rush in relief for those whom God is in the process of rebuking. Oh, this calls for incredible discernment on our part. We must be very careful here. But sometimes the greatest kindness we can do for a person is is to let them experience the consequences of their decision. We can show them kindness while they reap the fruit of their actions, but it may not be helpful to try to eliminate or alter those consequences. God may be bringing them to repentance, and we step in the way. And that's another important truth about kindness. Number six today, it can lead to repentance. can lead us to turn around and move toward God. Romans 2.4 Do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, tolerance, and patience? Not realizing, listen to this, God's kindness leads you toward repentance. When the truth and the gravity of my sin finally soaked into me, when I came face to face with that ugly person in the mirror, when I came to see myself for what I had become, I cried out for mercy. And it came. Because God is kind. When, the, when repentance is the handle to the door of salvation, we've got to use the handle. And when we come to realize our sin and we are able to finally hear Jesus knocking at our door... And when we truly hear that knock, that call to open up to God and, and be forgiven and, and step across the line to Jesus, the handle that opens that door is on our side, the inside. And we must open it or it won't go open. So when God's kindness soaks in on us, we are drawn to repentance and that is a very good thing. God's kindness is an offering of the life of His Son to pay for our sins. That's overwhelming. How many of us would do that? Hey, listen, I've got three sons. And with all due respect, I wouldn't give any of them for your sins. I'm sorry, I'm just not that kind. But God is. And He gave His only Son to pay for our sin. And so when we think about God's incredible kindness, our hearts should be brought to repentance. We can be led to cry out, forgive me, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry for my sin. Help me, Lord. I want to turn around. I want to follow you. Is that what you need today? God's being kind to let you hear that because some people are in this room won't hear that. One last word about kindness. It is best seen in Jesus. I have come to love these verses from the book of Titus. I have uh, rewritten them in my Bible in a personalized form. And 
where it says, we and us, I have inserted I or me. And so look, on the screen, you're going to see the scripture as it appears in the Bible. I'm going to read you my version that I rewrote for me. Because it's to you too. It's for every one of us. At one time, I too was foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. I lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating others. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved me, not because of the righteous things I had done, but because of His mercy, His kindness. He saved me through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on me generously, through Jesus Christ our Savior. The kindness of God has appeared in Jesus Christ and He died on a cross to save us. And we can be forgiven and saved because of the Lord's kindness. Can we do anything other than praise Him for that and follow Him? That is indeed our task. It can all be summed up well in Ephesians 2, 6-9. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by works, so no one could boast. Have you been saved? That's a yes or no answer. Have you accepted the kindness of Jesus Christ? Are you still trying to save yourself by being a good person? Give it up. If you want to boast about something, make sure you boast about the kindness of God. And then be sure to validate that boast by being kind with your own kindness. We are called to grow in kindness, church. A kindness that we know firsthand through our Savior Jesus Christ. Kindness that leads us to grow in God's orchard. Kindness that will cause us to increase the sweetness of the heart of the fruit over and over again. So how's your heart? Process that question. How is your heart really? Is it growing the fruit of the Spirit? Is Jesus growing there? Because He's alive. Through the Holy Spirit, He wants to grow in you. There are a couple of responses that you could give this morning. They're listed at the bottom of your note sheets and you know, if you don't get a note sheet, some of this is not going to mean a lot. But we got plenty of them. Just grab one when we come in. I, I tried to tell the ushers, please start giving everybody a, a note sheet. Because this is a place you can keep track of what we say. I think we should be able to sign our names on one of these, other, one of these two dotted lines. Let's, let's take a moment to read them. First is, I praise God for the unmerited kindness that He has shown me. I know Jesus lives in my heart and that He has saved me, I pray that I can grow the fruit of kindness in my life. If you have been a believer for many years and you know you are, you can sign this if you want to ask God to continue to grow His fruit of kindness. The second statement is for those that maybe aren't sure yet. I want to know the kindness He has offered to me. I believe God has offered His kindness to me and I want to know for sure I am saved I now receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. And I'm telling you today, if you do that in your heart, you'll be like our testimony. The chains will fall off and you will feel it. I would encourage you not to leave this room today uncommitted. I would encourage you to sign on one of those two lines this morning. Consider the kindness of the Lord to you and your response to His kindness. Now listen, if you signed on that second line, the one to accept God's kindness and receive Him as Savior and Lord, I want you to come to the front of the church this morning as it's a first step of obedience. Every man Jesus ever called, He called them out of the crowd. He called them publicly to follow Him. I want you to put some feet to your faith 
and it'll firm that faith up immediately. Become a recipient of God's kindness here this morning. Can you do that? Let's stand for prayer. Lord, we, we really want to follow through on that political boast from the 1990s and be a kinder and gentler church. We want to be a kinder and gentler people. And so, Lord, help us accept you into our lives. Help us to accept your Holy Spirit's work there. And, and do the work on our part to grow stronger. Lord, we thank you for putting kindness at the heart of the fruit. And I pray today that there will be those who will taste your sweetness, maybe for the first time. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, we're a salvation church. We've done this every week since we started. But if Jesus has spoken to you today, if God is calling you to something other than where you've been, you want to start something new, a new life, you step out of this crowd and you come to the front. Now listen, we're not going to do anything goofy up here. It's not like you see on TV. We're not going to knock you down or anything like that. You come, and we're just going to pray over you. That's it. And somebody will ask you, what can we pray for you about? That's your day. You come. God bless you. God bless you. Others today.